So this morning's keynote is going to be given by Mary Sheeran. Uh, the title of the talk is Functional Programming and Hardware Design Still Interesting After All These Years. Uh, Mary got her DPhil from Oxford. She's uh, taught at Glasgow where I met her and she moved to Chalmers uh, in 2002 uh, where she's been ever since. Uh, she's championed the connection... <laughs> She's championed the connection between hardware and functional programming. Uh, she's worked on a number of systems to... Uh, uh, she's worked on a number of systems. UFP was her PhD work at Oxford. She's worked in Ruby, which was based in relations. She's worked in, uh, with Lava, which was based in functions. She also has a strange fascination with parallel prefix scans. Please join me, join me in thanking uh, and welcoming Mary Shu. I guess I'll have to. Shall I use this mic? It works now? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and rant. Um, unconstrained by science. That's the... um, so what I plan to do in this talk is just show you some stuff that I think is interesting in the hope of luring you into the field of functional programming and hardware design. Pardon? <laughs> oh! <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell you about some things that I find interesting, and then I also consulted some oracles who work at the coal face of hardware design, because I don't really work with real hardware design, so I had to talk, with, talk to some experts. So my talk is a mixture of things that I like and things that they told me about. So let, let, let's think first about hardware description languages. I thought, I thought I'd better find out more about hardware description languages if I'm going to tell you about them. So one question is, how old are they? When did, they, when did hardware description start? And I, oops. I just did something bad. Oh no. <laughs> I pressed the, the box. <laughs> Is there another thing to press? I pressed that. <laughs> Connection off. I'll try to remember to press the right button. So I, I found a paper from 1968 which um, starts nicely. It says, specifying, documenting, and controlling the design of digital systems are problems of increasing severity as such systems continue to grow in size and complexity. Wilkes and Stringer first recognized that a suitable design language could greatly reduce the magnitude of these problems and lead to a complete, precise, yet concise description of digital systems. That was a nice introduction to a paper. And then the next sentence was this. Unfortunately, their contribution is mostly <coughs> oriented towards the machine they were developing at the time and is not generally useful. <laughs> <laughs> Papers were snarkier in the 60s. <laughs> the, this paper also mentions uh, uh, languages based on Algol 60 and, and says about them, these languages are less than satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But it's interesting to me that Wil Morris Wilkes, who John says he was lectured by in Cambridge and who was the father of British computer architecture, also came up with the idea of hardware description languages. And the paper that's being snarkily referred to here is actually the paper in which the idea of microprogramming was introduced in 1952. Uh, the paper appeared in 1953. The work was presented apparently in 1951. So that's, that's cool. And I, I, I should add at this point that uh, my, my slides, when you eventually get to them, are full of clickable links. So I, I'm, I'm luring you in by making it easy to look at the stuff that I show you. So eventually you'll be able to click on these links and look at some of these old papers. Um, so that's one, one uh, possible oldest hardware description language paper. There's another one that's kind of an American contender, and that's Reed from MIT, from, also from 1952, who wrote a paper called Symbolic Synthesis of Digital Computers. Unfortunately, my university thinks that I don't want to look at papers older than 1988. <laughs> so I wasn't able to get hold of this paper, but I do have the abstract. And it's interesting to try to imagine oneself back to 1952. Even I wasn't born in 1952. And, and here, here's the, the abstract of this paper, and it talks about how a, a, a Boolean machine is like an uh, automatic operational filing system. The information is stored or recorded in sets of elementary boxes or files, each containing one of the symbols 0 or 1. And uh, you can think back to 1952 when people didn't even agree what to call things or what a computer was or anything. But this paper also talks about how to uh, generate uh, digital circuits from descriptions. So that's quite cool. But then I, I decided I'd look a bit further back. And, and uh, what I finally... Oops, I did it again! <laughs> <sighs> worked. Oh. I finally got back to 1937 and Shannon's MSc thesis, which introduces the idea of using Boolean algebra to reason about switching circuits. I'm glad I didn't know about this when I was a doctoral student, because if I'd known that somebody wrote a master's thesis and started a whole field, I might have given up. And <laughs> This is on, this is, I don't know why it says 1940 somewhere, although he submitted it in 1937, but this is online at MIT, and you can look at it, and it's a fascinating document. So if, if there's only one thing you look at from this talk, I, I think Shannon's MSc thesis is an interesting thing to look at. Now, if we, if we jump forward in time then and try to think about hardware description languages that perhaps we in this community would recognize, then it is the case that APL in the 60s has a serious past as a hardware description language. Um, a, an entire formal description of System 360 was made in APL at IBM. Uh, as we know, Iverson, uh, he, he likes the idea of using APL for everything from systems design down to, to circuit design. And, but they took this really, really seriously at IBM. So they, they hooked up APL to their synthesis, their synthesis system. So APL was their main hardware description language for a time. And in uh, 1970, they published a paper where they compared the results of uh, doing a hand design of the IBM 1800, which is some machine I know nothing about, and the generated uh, from their hardware synthesis system, the generated circuits. And they discovered that the generated circuits were 2.6 times larger than the hand design circuits. But then they studied their synthesis methods, and they decided that if they had more time and resources, they'd be able to get it down to 1.3 times larger. And this was, this was considered to be a, a kind of, this is a, a paper where they say, this is a good thing. This is a, APL is good for hardware generation. That was the 60s, and there's lots of other work in the 60s on hardware description languages. There was a, a plethora of hardware description languages then. Um, but then, what happened? I'm not exactly sure what happened. I became an undergraduate in, in electrical engineering in the late 70s, and I took a lot of electronics courses and some theoretical computer science courses, and there wasn't hide nor hair of a hardware description language in, in anywhere. They, they had all gone away. 
And I remember my uh, electronics courses where all we got were a sequence. Here's an adder. You know, here's an adder. Here's a multiplier. Uh, there was no way of describing these things except by pictures, and it was very frustrating. I did learn about formal methods, though. So I went off to Oxford to uh, pursue that interest. And I met Peter Henderson, who was my master's project supervisor in Oxford. And here's what he was doing at the time. He was playing with functional geometry and drawing Escher pictures. Some of you remember that. But he was also fascinated by this book. How many of you heard of Mead and Conway? A few, not many. <laughs> this is a fantastic book from 1980 about how to do VLSI design. And it opened up, VLSI stands for very large scale integration, it opened up circuit design, design to normal people like computer scientists. <laughs> <laughs> it took it away from the priesthood. And it has, four, it has more than 4,000 citations, and it started an industry. It start, you know, it's the basis on which Intel is built, and MIPS was built. It, it, you know, it's a fantastic book, and I looked on Amazon last week, and I discovered that you can buy it for 77 cents. <laughs> And I think somebody should go and do that right now. <laughs> um, so Peter Henderson was having his Mead and Conway phase. You know, people used to have Mead and Conway phases there. And, and he so for my master's thesis project, I generated the, the layout of a, a circuit which we then implemented in the, in the Mead and Conway multi-project chip style. So he drew Escher pictures, and I had the stress of trying to produce actual circuits. It was really, really stressful. We only were thinking about the layout. And I thought there must be some better way. And, and uh, Joe Stoy taught a fantastic denotational semantics course and introduced functional programming. And, and, and there was the answer. Okay. And, and, and part, another part of the answer was uh, coming out at roughly the same time with Bacchus's 1978 Turing Award paper where he introduced FP. And he talks about an alternative functional style of programming founded on the use of combining forms. And those combining forms were exactly what I felt I needed to describe circuits. It was like a, you know, a religious experience. <laughs> and so I wrote papers. I, I, I wrote papers where I, oh, I did it again. <laughs> I wrote papers where I advocated reasoning about regular array circuits, which were the type, the kind of thing that Mead and Conway were advocating that we design, using the combining forms introduced by Bacchus. We had to draw pictures by hand then. So this is a hand-drawn, stuck-into-the-paper kind of picture. And this, this is a, one of these algebraic laws that Bacchus talked about. So I've got to reduce. All the arrows also flow from right to left in the picture. So on the left is a reduce of G with a kind of block of Fs uh, composed with it. And on the right is a, um, a reduce of F composed with G. And, and, and the algebraic law says, if you can push the F through the G and get two Fs, then you'll also be able to push half a triangle through this reduce and get the remaining half of the triangle remaining on the outputs. And the Fs will appear on the carry so this kind of law allows you to reason about things like pipelining. And strange as it may seem, we actually got users. So we made an implementation of UFP. Most of the work was done by Geraint Jones and Wayne Look. And a design team at Plessy, who were making a video motion estimator regular array at that time, used a symbolic simulator and UFP to think about the flow of data in their circuit. And this was completely fantastic because their previous method of doing it was to draw the circuit on large pieces of graph paper in an empty room <laughs> and walk around on the graph paper to figure out whether the data came at the right points together. And so, so having a symbolic simulator was just, you could see the, the joy in, 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 the, in the faces. So they actually wrote a very nice paper about their, their array eventually, where they said at, at, at the beginning of a paragraph, using MuFP, the array processing element was described in just one line of code, and the complete array required four lines of MuFP description. 
and you have to be enable the effects of adding or moving data latches within the array to be assessed quickly. And then it goes on to talk about the importance of having a language to allow you to play with your circuit and, and the context in which it sits. <coughs> and and I, uh, uh, I didn't do it. This work, as I said before, was done by Geraint Jones and Wayne Look. I did talk a bit to the Plessy people, but by then I had left and gone to Glasgow. Um, so this was a success. Um, and then bad things happened. So we had another partner in the project, which was GEC, a bigger company, and they bought Plessy in the middle of the project and closed down the design team. And, and everything stopped. And it would be nice to be able to say, the story ended happily. We've convinced GEC to use MUFP. No, it didn't work. And there's a lot to be said about what happened in between, but let me be honest and talk about the reality today of of hardware description languages. Oh, I did it again! <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I took, a couple of years ago, a picture of the Wikipedia page for hardware description language in Swedish. I had to choose the Swedish one because the English one is different. Okay. <laughs> but this, the Swedish one says, there are two pages, Verilog and VHDL, and actually this is a very good representation of reality. It's a better representation of reality than the English one that has a long list of hardware description languages. And in fact, today the Swedish one also says delta delay, so that's even more strange, but, but this is correct. Okay. The reality is that, that hardware design, at least at the lower level, is completely dominated by 25-year-old and not very nice programming languages. And so uh, you might say, okay, maybe we can just stop now and have coffee, and, and that's the end of the story. We failed. And I, I don't want to say that. I want to say something different. So I'm going to explain in the rest of the talk why I'm still, in, despite this reality, I'm still interested in hardware description. And I'm going to first talk about why I'm interested in it, and then I'm going to uh, invoke my oracles. So even if we can't persuade Intel to change the way they do the lowest level of hardware design, and I talked to one of my oracles about that, and I don't think we can, it's still interesting to think about hardware in a functional programming language. And I'm going to show you uh, why, or to attempt to show you why. I'm going to think about circuits that operate on arrays, and I'm going to draw pictures of these arrays as boxes, and I'm going to read those arrays in, I think it's called column major. I'm going to re read each column. In, in, in. So we're going to think of them as being numbered from zero. And I'm going to think about combinators for plugging together circuits to work on these arrays and, and illustrate them pictorially. So here is interleave or ILV. Okay, so this interleave applies a function on the even elements of the array and on, on the odd elements of the array. So it applies the function on every second element of the array. Two applies the function on the first half and the second half of the array. And it turns out that two and ILV, if you think of this picture, commute nicely with each other. So it's the case that two of ILV of F is the same as ILV of two of F. And once you have things like ILV, you can start to describe um, well-known networks, well-known constructions. So here's a construction called a butterfly network, and it's made out of ILV. So a butterfly network is made by interleaving two half-sized butterfly networks, and then composing something on the right-hand end. I'm going to call that evens. It applies the small function f to adjacent elements of the array. You could make that by repeated uses of two, but I'm just going to make, make it easy. So this is a butterfly network. If we draw a picture of the butterfly network, we end up with it looking like this. So we, the, the interleaves call, cause these rifflings and unrifflings. And it's a bit hard to see what's happening. So there's a standard notation used. So what we're going to do is take the wires and hold them at each end so that the, the, the little functions get stretched. So we're going to end up with uh, this kind of representation of a butterfly network. So now the, each of those vertical uh, lines corresponds to one of these 
two input, two output functions that get applied, get supplied to, to pairs of elements of the array. And this is a butterfly network. And this is actually the shape that is used in, for example, making FFT. But it's also the shape of Batcher's bitonic merge. How many of you have heard of Batcher's sorter? A few, and not all. Um, so Batcher in 1969 wrote a great paper where he explained how to do sorting in a hardware-like network. He introduced the idea of a bitonic sequence. A bitonic sequence is one that is, starts off increasing and then is decreasing, or some cyclic rotation of such a sequence. And his eureka idea was that if you take such a, a, a bitonic sequence and push it through the first column of these two sorters, then you end up with two smaller bitonic sequences. And all of the elements of the top one are greater than or equal to all the elements of the bottom one. So that means if you keep going, you'll at the end get a sorted sequence. So the, the, the butterfly of two sorters takes a bitonic sequence and produces a sorted sequence. And so the next question for making a sorter is, well, how can we make a bitonic sequence? Ah, we can use recursion. We've already used it once in the butterfly, but let, let's use it again. So we can take two half-size sorters and sort and reverse the output of one of them to produce a bitonic sequence. And then we'll put that into a butterfly of two sorters and we'll get a sorted sequence at the end. And here's how it looks in the in the more standard notation, where I've marked in blue one of the half-size sorters. And for 16 inputs, uh, this consumes or uses uh, 80 of these two sorters. And, and in the same paper, he also... Oh, in the same paper, he also introduces the idea of odd, even, merge sort, which is very similar to the, at least if you have an, a language for describing these things, it's very similar to the bitonic sort. You can make odd even merge by interleaving to half size odd even merge, but the thing that you compose on the end is not evens, but it's odds, which is something that looks like the right hand side of this picture. It, it applies the two sorters, not between the zero and one, two and three, but between, but skipping the first and last element. And, and applying it at adjacent elements otherwise. So this is a picture of the butterfly-like thing that you get from ILV and odds rather than from ILV and evens. And if you then, uh, and, and it turns out that this merger merges not the bitonic sequence, but a sequence whose, each of whose halves is sorted. So then you can make a sorter by just using two half-size sorters and feeding that into the odd even merger. And because of the use of, of odds instead of evens, this thing needs fewer uh, two sorters. It needs 63 instead of 80. And there are more combinators that, uh, wh where these came from. Um, here's one. I ran out of good names. Here's one. Q. <laughs> this, this applies F to the first to all the 0, 1, and then skips 2, and then and so on. So the blue is all one application of F, and the white is all another application of F. And if you, uh, and here's another one. I call this one V. Uh, so this is interesting because it applies F to the first element, and then it applies F to the, f the next two, and so on. And uh, if you take Q and make a merger, as on the right-hand side of this picture, uh, make a butterfly-like thing out of Q and odds, then you get Canfield and Williamson's periodic merger. So this merger is interesting because you can compose log n of, of them in sequence and get a sorter. But it also sorts the interleave of two sorted uh, sequences, so you can make, again, a recursive sorter with, with uh, 63 uh, two sorters. Um, and, the, and we know very little, actually, about um, how to do sorting well on small numbers of inputs. 
Um, for 16 inputs, which is a very usual number of inputs that we'd like to sort, the best known such sorting network has 60 um, two sorters. There's a, whole, there's a whole chapter about this in Knuth, and it's wonderful. And, and that was invented by Green, I think, in about 1969. And nobody knows why it works. Um, <laughs> and, no, and, and people who, who do search for sorting networks have equaled 60, but they've never done better. But we have no idea about optimality uh, beyond nine inputs. So there's lots of unanswered questions about sorting networks. I'll come back to that in a while. Now, sometimes you don't want to make a whole sorter. You want to do something a bit less than sorting. So Satnam persuaded me <laughs> at some point to be interested in median networks. So what is a median network? It's something a bit like a sorter. It takes an odd number of inputs and it produces the, the middle of the sorted uh, output on the middle wire. And it has all the elements that are less than or equal to that uh, input above and all that are greater than or equal to below, but it doesn't need those values to be sorted. It, it's just the, that middle wire that we're trying to get. And finding the median, for example, of 25 inputs, which this is a picture of, is something that we need to do, for example, when we do median filtering and we take 25 pixels and produce at the middle pixel the median of those pixels. So it's a, a, an interesting function uh, in reality. So I wrote a paper in uh, 98 where I uh, got down to 98 uh, comparators for median. That, that was the the piece of code that I was willing to show in the paper. I also got down to 96 with a piece of code that was too embarrassing. But I, I did check using a SAT solver that it really was median, so I, I, I know that I got it right. And that's a picture of the 96 median. But on the web, there is a, a, a famous piece of C code with 99 compare and swaps in it that people use for, 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 for doing median. And the folklore says that's the best you can do. So, so, so I wrote to, to Pace and I said, well, I, I can do it in 96, but he didn't reply. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I, I, only for this talk have I produced the picture of this, this network. So I've, this is the first time I've seen it, and it looks very unsymmetrical to me. I would expect a median network to be symmetrical about that middle line, but this one isn't. Um, how did I produce it? I, so in, when we do functional hardware description languages, we write things that look like circuit descriptions, but we run them in order to produce netlists. And what I've done here is that I've, I've done the usual running of a sorter, but in parallel, at the Haskell level, I've done some c computation of wh what I know about the different wires so that I only include in the sorter those comparators that I, are going to help me for producing the median. So it's a kind of hackery, synthesis hackery, that allows you to... Uh, to beat numbers. Um, and and, and uh, so this kind of hackery is actually interesting, um, not only if you want to make circuits, but even if you might want to make you know, pieces of sequential C code that uh, do such uh, comparisons. Now, given yesterday's talk, keynote talk, you're probably thinking to yourselves, search. <coughs> and that's a good thought. I didn't search for the median but I have played with search for finding these kind of networks. And, and I, my, my second most proud moment <laughs> in my career was finding this sentence in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a paper from 2013. It says, recently a sequence of two to the n input prefix circuits of depth n and complexity L of two to the n, we'll, we'll discuss what that means, in a moment, at least for n less than or equal to 25, was discovered by Sheeran, and that's a reference to my JFP paper from 2011, via computer programming. <laughs> um, this, this sentence was written by a mathematician. <laughs> um, it, it's written, so... Actually, when I put up the 2011 paper, this mathematician, like two days after it went up on the JFP site, this mathematician wrote to me by email and he said, it's very interesting, you found prefix networks that match my lower bound. Unfortunately, my papers are all in Russian. <laughs> but the, 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 he eventually did, in 2013, uh, produce this 
Fantastic paper. I mean, he's a super complexity theorist, and he's written a paper which proves a lower bound for parallel prefix networks. And it's this lower bound, you know, 3.5 times 2 to the n and so on. <laughs> and, and in my JFP paper, I found prefix networks that exactly match this lower bound. Now, I did not find them by, really by search. I invented them. But I used search as an aid to the invention. So what I did was I searched using lazy dynamic programming for good prefix networks. I poured over the XFIG pictures of these resulting networks. And then I had a eureka moment and invented a very good way to do prefix networks. And this is important. Having a language to describe things and to play with them is the key to making new algorithmic developments. Um, so I, I, I tentatively said to this complexity theorist, maybe, maybe we could write a paper together. He said, no, computer scientists will not understand. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the, it, it's a heroic proof. I mean, it, the proof of his lower bound is, a, is absolutely amazing, and I, I can't say that I really grasp it. Um, but I was able to find circuits with the same complexity. Here's a picture of... Uh, it's hard to see, but this is a picture for 128 inputs. It uses 364 of the associate, operate, associate of operator, and that's five better than uh, Ladner Fisher, which is a, a famous uh, prefix network. And as the numbers go up, the, the amount better it is goes up too. And so the whole key here is that if you have a notation, you can play, and if you can play, you can invent. Now, search. I, I, I made these slides before yesterday's talk, but search is a fantastic um, help in, in discovering new things. <clears throat> and so I'm going to show you uh, some examples. So one is, is spiral. This is um, an approach in which they have a, a small DSL for expressing networks and the algebra of networks, and they search for uh, good implementations uh, by applying algebraic laws and so on. So it's, it's the kind of search that does rely on the algebra. They uh, generate uh, circuits. They generate uh, uh, various kinds of low-level code and so on. And they have a great website that sh should be uh, uh, guiding all of us about how to present your, <laughs> your research in a good website. So it's fantastic work. So please look at that. Um, now. <clears throat> It turns out that there's a bunch of, I didn't know this before I started on the keynote, you know, there's a bunch of people who are using search to, to think about sorting networks too. And um, so these people, Val Salam and Mikulainen, they are trying to push the limits of what, how, how can we make small sorting networks for small numbers of, numbers of inputs. And you can see here that up as far as 16 inputs, um, it, um, they weren't able to make a, any improvements, but beyond 16 inputs, we know very little. So they, in their uh, SAT-based approach to, uh, to looking for uh, sorting networks, reduced the best known 17 input sorting network for here from 73 to 71. And that as a result of a theorem by Van Voorhis, who's the other guru besides Batcher about sorting networks, um, allows them also to reduce the best known for some of the other numbers. Um, and this is heroic, hero, heroic search. Um, and I think, I, I think some of these numbers are up for grabs. So I think 71 is quite high for 17 inputs. So uh, after I go home, I'm going to play with getting this number down. And maybe some of you clever people might also want to do that. Because if you do this, if you get this down from 71 to 70, you can get your name in a book by Knoop. <laughs> That, that was my favorite uh, career moment, but that was for another reason. <clears throat> it's also the case that you can use search to prove optimality uh, by searching through all the possible, uh, for example, all the possible 24, uh, all the possible 24 comparator nine input sorting networks to prove that you can't do better than 25. So the so on the top of that line, it shows what we know about how to make networks. And on the line below it, it shows the known lower bounds. And, and so now they've, they've made the lower bound match the upper bound here for 9 and 10 inputs. That's where we are. 
in knowing about optimality for sorting networks. These are very small numbers, but, but these are also very hard searches. So only as far as 10 do we know what is the smallest uh, number of comparators needed for a sorting network. So I think there are some numbers up for grabs here also for this clever community. And why are people who are not actually really interested in hardware design playing with sorting networks? Um, here's one of the reasons. There's, we, we have another reason for needing circuits. The reason is that we can use these circuits in doing verification. So, for example, this paper from 2006 from the Minisat guys is about translating pseudo-Boolean constraints into SAT. And they do it by using Batcher's odd even sorting network that I showed you before. So these guys, these verification people, are interested in designing better sorting networks, better median networks, better case selection networks, and so on. So there's a kind of virtual reason for being interested in circuits, even if you're never going to implement them as circuits. That's kind of opened the field again, I think. So th these are the reasons I'm fascinated. These numbers are like red rags to a bull to me. I want to produce some of these numbers. And also I want to understand these, these structures in, in the large by first studying them in the small and then, and then developing new constructions to replace those by Batcher and Van Boris, which are from the 60s and 70s. So we haven't made progress in designing good algorithms for these things since then. And we need to make progress. <coughs> So that was, that was my, this is my take on functional programming and, and, and circuit-like things. And you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, but those are not real circuits. So I also talk to people who do real circuits. So the next section is about hardware and functional programming in the real world. Um, <laughs> in 1990, I think it was 1994, Intel released a faulty Pentium 4. Uh, and then they kind of screwed up on, on dealing with the, the flack that came afterwards. Um, although they did afterwards, I, I would love to have been be able to show a picture, they did af afterwards produce a key ring with these faulty Pentium 4s in them and hand them out to every Intel employee. And at the back of the key ring, there was a quote from Andy Grove that said uh, something like, um, um, great... The, the, there were a number of things, but great, great companies are improved by crises. <laughs> there was a number of good companies uh, survive them and so on. So, and, and the effect that I saw of this Pentium bug, bug is that suddenly half my friends in formal verification were working for Intel. <laughs> <laughs> and many of them still do. And I consulted one of them, Carl Seeger. Um, about the current status of functional programming and formal verification in Intel. And he gave me some slides for which I thank him. In Intel, they use a system called, for called Forte to do formal verification of what he calls computational structures. So, in, in other words, this might be called the data path parts of, of processors, the, the algorithmic parts. In fact, the floating point units. <laughs> and this, this Forte system has thousands of users. So there are thousands of people inside Intel sitting doing formal verification in a system that's based on a, a lazy functional programming language called FL. And it has built-in BDDs, decision procedures, and a hardware symbolic simulator, a, a, a symbolic trajectory evaluation engine, which is a, a kind of model checking. And FL is used in this context in very many ways, in, in, in ways that will be familiar to many of us. It's used as a design language, as a high-level specification language, as an object language for theorem proving, a scripting language, and as the implementation language for formal verification tools. And this is a success, a quiet success for functional programming that's just going on quietly inside Intel. And it's extremely cool stuff. Um, Carl gave me various examples of the use of FL in various contexts. I'm not going to go through them now, but you will be able to look at them later, because I don't really have time. But he also told me uh, about uh, two tools that are used, uh, additional tools that are used in, in, inside Intel. One I knew about before called IDV, 
integrating design and verification, which is 280,000 lines of, of FL, plus a bunch of tickle TK. And this was the nearest tool to the vision that I had as a, a doctoral student of using algebraic transformations on circuits. It allows you to start at a high level description of your circuit, apply transformations to that circuit, and eventually deal with the physical placement of the, of the transistors. And I loved it. I, tr I pers tried to persuade them to give it to me for teaching digital design. It would have been so fantastic, but we never got it out of Intel. And in fact, they don't continue to use it. It had a number of successes where, in fact, what they did was, in order to move um, designs from one process to, to the other, they took, they took the design in one process and they did the opposite of, of refinement up to a, to a specification and then back down to another process. So it had a, a niche in moving designs from one process to another. And then he also talked about a, a formal verification tool uh, based on FL. And there, here there are links to two papers that describe uh, both the Forte system and how verification is done in practice at Intel today. And this is a, these are huge success stories that we perhaps don't know very much about. Now, there's another x86 provider called Centaur. Um, and they do also heroic <laughs> formal verification. Because in, I mean, in, in hardware, the price of getting it wrong is very high. So the FDF bug, bug Intel took a $475 million loss. And, and it probably wasn't good for the reputation either. And Carl used to say, we, we can afford maybe one more bug, but two will kill the company. So the, the price of getting it wrong is very high in hardware. And so it's, it's really in, in formal verification and, it's, uh, and the use of functional programming in that context that we see successes. So the work at Centaur starts with the, it's post hoc verification also. It starts with the very large file that is the implementation. And it starts with a, a specification of what an instruction should do. And it, it, it uh, compares those two to make sure that uh, instructions are, are uh, implemented correctly. And it's all based on ACL2, which is, uh, it stands for, what does ACL2 stand for? Um, a computational logic for applicative common lisp. So it's, a, it's an interactive theorem prover. And it's been uh, developed by uh, Matt Kaufman and Warren Hunt has played a lot of, of, uh, done a lot of the work in getting it used inside Centaur. And they're, what they're doing is they're increasing the areas of trust, the parts of the chip that they have formally verified, and they run the, the, the proofs of each of those parts overnight, every night, every time they make any changes to the circuit. And he has, he has also spectacular plans for formalizing uh, the entire x86 uh, instruction set and, and you know, building a whole verified uh, um, chain from, from compiler and, uh, and downwards. It's, this is also heroic formal verification work. But it's not about design. It's about ver post hoc verification of circuits that are designed using those other languages. So uh, my next oracle um, was uh, Nikhil, who is CTO of BlueSpec. And I said to him, I have to give a keynote. I foolishly agreed to give a keynote. What will I say about BlueSpec? And he said, he looked at the title and he said, I would have said, I wouldn't have said still interesting. I would have said even more interesting. <laughs> and he's, his, his message is that over the last two years, the interest in uh, using their uh, Blue Spec System Verilog or System Verilog or BSV has greatly increased. And he said there are two reasons why they see an upsurge in interest in another way to do hardware design. And one of them is the rise of, of um, FPGAs. He said FPGAs are being designed by a whole different bunch of people who don't have a hardware background and who are interested in <coughs> modern programming languages and in being able to analyze their designs and change them and uh, have evolving designs and so on. And the other reason... Oh, I did it again. The other reason is the, the malware and hacking scares that have happened. So there's a greatly... In, in the FPGA world, there's a greatly increased interest in end-to-end -end formal verification because of fears of um, opening for 
uh, very bad things to happen. Um, so BSV is um, a combination of, you might say, the, the kind of structural hardware description languages that is familiar to us who, who did Lava-like things, plus um, guarded atomic transaction rules. So it's like term rewriting systems meet functional programming. Lennart is one of the developers, and I will defer all questions about BSV to Lennart at the end. Um, and um, Nikhil gave me some slides. And interestingly enough, the slides also contained butterflies, um, as I've been talking about before. So w one of the things that he, he argued for in the, sli the slides that he gave me wa was that um, with BlueSpec, it is possible to explore very many different implementations of the same function. For example, if you're trying to make an inverse FFT, there's very many... Oh, dear me. There's very many choices. You can start with a combinational circuit and add various amounts of pipelining, or you can decide to, to uh, feed data back around in some parts of the circuit and so on. And the combination of kind of a library for give, doing structural descriptions with the rules gives you something extremely powerful. So it, it, it seems that adding the idea of rules to, um, to uh, f structural hardware description gives you a, a, a very attractive approach to doing hardware design. Um, so just like we saw for the IBM 1800 from a long time ago, here's an example where what they've done is compare um, BSV generated FPGA implementations of some uh, uh, H.264 and filters and so on. And now the numbers look a lot better. So for um, hand-coded VHDL for the combination of these three on the smaller size, the, the the BSV generated uh, implementation is one third the size of what was produced by hand coded. And for the much larger size, it's uh, 0 0.8 the size of the, of the hand coded implementation for the small size. These are spectacular results. And you might think, oh, well, is this real? No, is it fudged or something? And, um, and uh, Nickel's answer to that is that BSV often beats hand-coded register transfer level code. And why might that be? Because you can produce algorithmically superior designs. So you, ha you have a, it's the same story. You have a language in which to explore possible designs. It's easy to make changes. It's easy to make major architectural changes. And as a result, you, you, much, you have a much better chance of finding a good implementation. And there's a nice paper, this is also a clickable link, a nice paper by, by uh, Nikhil about what, which parts of functional programming have contributed to this success. Now, they also have, um, uh, what might you call it, uh, another um, tool in their arsenal. This is something new that I only just found out about called Blue Check and it's related to quick check, which some of you have heard of. And, and this is a very recent paper, it hasn't appeared yet, it will appear at the end of the month. It's called the Generic Synthesizable Test Bench, and it allows FPGA designers to provide an executable specification and for free get the entire test bench, um, including uh, shrinking and finding information about coverage. And apparently this is blowing minds. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm not going to go through the examples, but the point is this, that the, the shrinking and the iterative deepening, which is the, the approach to generating in, uh, inputs of different sizes, can happen on the FPGA. So that means, for example, in one of the examples he talked about, you, you change from being able to do 350 tests a second to being able to do 150,000 tests a second. And so this makes a huge difference to the productivity. They have linked it also up to uh, a software tool for uh, studying, 
So there, he, he's in the context where they're in a big project making the memory system for a multi-core machine. And uh, they need to worry about things like sequential consistency. And they're able to hook this whole quick check thing with shrinking up to a software tool which generates tests for checking sequential consistency. And they end up with much, much shorter um, uh, failing test cases than they do in, in any other way. And this is, this is just, uh, we all have heard this before. I mean, the, the, the shrinking is a huge win. So this is a, a fantastic work, very new. And apparently BlueSpec themselves are making a lot of use of this tool. And around BlueSpec, there's also a lot of interesting work um, on, on formal verification. Um, I, I picked on two uh, papers by Adam Schipola and other people. Um, one is a, um, a paper about formal verification of hardware synthesis where we end up not verifying that the resulting circuits for a fixed size are correct, but the whole generation of parametric circuits. In, if this is done in the context of COC. And, it, and, and, and that paper has also got a Pythonic sorter in it. So there's a, there's a theme arrive, arising here. Um, and then there's a follow-on a follow paper building on some of those ideas from uh, CAV this year, which again uses COC to do the first machine verification of sequential consistency for a multi-core hardware design that includes caches and speculative processors. So I would say that BlueSpec is not only you know, winning ground in, out in the real world in doing real designs, but it's also a, a basis for a lot of really, really interesting work on formal verification. How am I doing for time? Sorry. I'm going to skip that. Um, what about Lava and similar things? There's a, a new language called Chisel, which is a, a rather Lava-like thing but uh, implemented in Scala, and with lots of users in an architecture design group. And it's really, really cool. And you should look at that. <laughs> That's all I will say. And then there's Cryptol, which is a domain-specific language for describing crypt cryptographic algorithms, and it has a route to FPGA. Um, I, I, this is a paper that uh, th that that book from 2010 has a lot of interesting papers. It has the paper about the Centaur verification. It has Cryptol and has lots of other interesting papers. I like this Cryptol paper. It talks about how they get to FPJ, and it has the notion of undelay, which I call anti-delay, but it's uh, uh, the opposite of a delay and the use of that in uh, thinking about circuits. And there are, I think there are opportunities for this community also here. So there's a company called Maxillar in London that sells a gigantic FPGA and, and when you buy it, you also get a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just so hard to program. So, they, so they've introduced, the, they're, they're trying to pretend that it's not hardware design. It's something different. It's spatial programming. But actually, it's hardware design. And they're asking for help in developing languages for programming this thing. So this is called the Open Spatial Language Initiative. And they want input. And we, this community, should be providing input, I think. And my, my, my final oracle is uh, Andreas Olofsson, who's the CEO of a small company called Adaptiva. And here, you, I could hash include a, a, a rant from Satnam, or I could hash include the animation from yesterday's talk about what, what, what machines are going to look like in the future. So this is the slides from a tech talk by Andreas, which he gave at Chalmers, where he, he, he told his whole story of developing the parallel board, which contains uh, a multi-core uh, uh, chip that he designed, um, uh, a, a Xilinx Zinc FPGA plus two ARM cores. And it's credit card sized, and you can buy it for $99. I bought the $199 one because then I got a bigger FPGA. And it's very low power and very interesting and very, very difficult to program. <laughs> and he wants help. So he told the story of how he went from, from you know, Kickstarter and getting this thing made and selling large numbers of them and being invested in by Ericsson because they're interested in the low power aspect. And this is the, this is the end of his talk. So, it, I, he, so basically, you might say, 
people like Andreas, they can do the hardware design. We don't need to help him about hardware design, but we need to help them about how to program these things. Okay. So, and, and programming these things is going to be very difficult because they're going to not only appear in ones, they're going to be appear in, in, in large numbers. So the world that we thought we lived in, where hardware was on one side and software was on the other, and we divide our students early, and we're in different divisions if we're interested in hardware or software, those days are gone. This is what, sir, this is what, what machines look like now. They mix FPGAs and, and Andreas's multi-core and CPUs and, and GPUs. And, and um, when I asked Carl Seeger from Intel, well, are there any, is there any hope for us to you know, influence what happens at a company like Intel? And he, what he said was, the FPGAs are moving into the processors. And there's an announcement today of a, of a Xeon chip with an FPGA in the processor. And so we can no longer make this distinction between hardware and software. And we're going to have large, very large numbers of these things to program. So programming is going to need to deal with heterogeneity, and it's going to need to deal with massive parallelism. And we, we do lots of interesting work in this community. Um, some of it's at this conference. And there are, but still, I, 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 I kept, I, I was positive until the very end, but let me, let me say this. Still, I lack a high level language that allows me to think about playing with time and space the way hardware designers do. So you might say that the, the research that I started to do when I was a doctoral student, I have not succeeded in. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about it still. There, there's still a lot of work to do. There, there's old work like work by Corman that can be useful and so on. But I need help. So I'm hoping to lure somebody into this who might think that this is an interesting question. How do we think about the kind of trade-offs between space and time that designers do? I've, I've been involved in setting up our running workshops that gather the right groups of people to think about these kind of questions. It used to be that this conference was called Functional Programming Languages and Computer Architecture, and then the right groups of people were at this conference, but, but now we've kind of uh, gone away from that. Maybe we need to go back to it. So this is my final slide. Programming future machines is going to be much more like hardware design than is comfortable. Um, so it's not only the case that functional programming and hardware is still interesting, the ideas might be important, even for programming future machines. That's all I have to say. My graduate work, which was done about the same time as yours, was on uh, lower bounds for parallel computation. And at the time, the big result was the AKS log depth sorting network. I'm wondering if you ever thought about that messy, complicated result and how one might use FP to simplify these ideas. You mean to get, to get the, the constants down? Not just get the constants down, but uh, also log depth networks, which seem to be harder than log square depth yes. networks. I have not really thought about that, now. <laughs> so that was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, on the note of how our abstractions are changing, looking into how the computational substrates are changing, uh, the, the sorting network that you mentioned, one way to judge their complexity is to count the comparators, right? And you want to minimize that. But if you want to implement them not in hardware, but in software, say FPGU, then those wires are not free, right? You need to implement them as indexing operations into arrays and such. And there, minimizing comparators may actually lead to complicated index expressions, which then cost more than the comparators themselves. Yeah. So other abstractions, other thoughts on how to come up with different cost model for 
having networks that are easy to implement. So in, in, in the context, I haven't played with this in the context of sorting networks, but I have in the context of parallel prefix networks, because there, I, 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 when I was using dynamic programming to search for prefix networks, mm -hmm. I sometimes tried not to minimize the number of comparators, but say the length of all the wires or various other cost models. And, 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 and the other thing you might want to minimize is um, the, the size of the largest feedback the size of the largest fan out, for instance, or something like that. So I, I'm lucky that I have VLSI, a VLSI group in my own department who help with uh, deciding what, is, what are reasonable cost models, at least for making circuits. So I, I think it's possible to do work in that direction. We haven't done very much, but we, could do, we should do more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very nice talk, Mary. Um, so we often sort things so that we can search uh, using binary search efficiently. Um, so on modern hardware that has uh, caches, binary search is often not the most efficient way uh, or when we have them elements lined up like this. So often it's better to have some kind of B tree or some other order. So what is known about doing uh, sort of circuits that, that produce this kind of order that is, that is better for uh, in cache hierarchies and stuff? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it sounds very interesting. I haven't found it. Uh, so as I understand the work on parallel prefix networks, there's this lovely tradition of program derivation, and you start with a very simple description, and you can get pretty good parallel prefix networks. And I, 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 somewhere in the mid-'90s, I think they, that sort of went out. And then you jump ahead a bit, and then you have these things you've shown where you, know, you synthesize a bunch of stuff, and you think very hard, and then you test it and you get better ones and my understanding is that you know th there's a real gap there and do you think it's possible to close that gap or is there just a point at which the program derivation techniques fall off and there's just things that are not imaginable in that way? Well, I think for, for prefix networks in particular we know very well what they look like, mm -hmm. we know how they are decomposed but what we don't know is what should be the size of the different components. But we, I mean, we understand very well how to do parallel prefix, and so this, I, I, I don't think it's a good example where okay. program derivation would be of value. There prob I think maybe sorting might be a better example. Mm -hmm. Good question, very good.